In the workshop, making a mounting base for a Castle Steam V6 coal-fired boiler, and this is part two. In the previous episode, I showed the machining of this cast iron ring. It really is a substantial piece of metal. Now it's time to fix the main ash pan to this piece of cast iron. But I do need to make sure that the ash pan is in the centre of the piece of cast iron. That in itself is not very difficult, and there are many different ways to do this. With a bit of trial and error, and a ruler, I found the perfect position for the ash pan on the cast iron base, leaving half an inch all the way round. What I've just been doing is counting the holes around the perimeter of the ash pan, because I'm going to use the holes around the edge to mark out the position for the mounting holes on the cast iron. But first of all, I need to drill some holes through the base of the ash pan. I'm using a tool called a transfer punch, and these are very useful to have in your workshop. For instance, if I want to mount a stationary steam engine on a base, I firmly hold the steam engine in the position where I want it, and then I would use a transfer punch through the holes in the mounting lugs on the steam engine, tap them with a hammer, and then make a neat impression in the wooden base. Unfortunately, that principle will not work with this ash pan, as the holes around the edge are drilled through thin sheet metal, which is not thick enough to support the transfer punch and hold it in a vertical position. So here's a top tip. If you're doing a job like this, get a piece of mahogany, drill a hole in it the same size as the transfer punch, then do this. And as you can see, this keeps the transfer punch vertical all the time. And just a few blows with a small hammer makes a neat impression in the base metal. All I have to do is repeat this all the way round. Over now to the drilling machine. And then with a suitable twist drill that's a good fit in the holes around the edge, I just line it up with the centre pot marks created by the transfer punch. Quite simple really when you think about it. If you're doing this job or a similar job to this, remember that you do not want a bolt right in the middle of the exit point for the ash. This is an ordinary pencil, but I've mutated it on my belt sander. And why did I do this? Well, the pencil in its original form was just a little bit too wide, and it was touching the sides of the ash pan, making it very difficult to accurately mark the position of the holes onto the cast iron. And once I ended up with lots of small pencil rings on the cast iron, it was a simple job using a felt tip pen to put crosses on them to find the centre. You can clearly see from this clip that I've only marked the position for five holes on the cast iron ring. And I haven't made a mistake, as I mentioned earlier, I've left the gap because this is the part of the ash pan where you scrape the ashes out. And the last thing you need is a great big bolt in the way. It's now time to drill the holes in the cast iron ring. To start with, I'm using a centre drill, and if you watch the video carefully, you'll see how I position the centre drill right in the middle of the cross. After brushing away the swarf, I fitted a twist drill into the chuck, and this drill is tapping size for M6. Why M6? Well, it just so happens that I have quite a few Allen caphead bolts that are M6. And these are ideal for holding the ash pan down onto the cast iron base. So once I drilled all of the holes, tapping size for M6, it's time to tap some M6 holes in them. To make sure that the tap enters the hole squarely, I'm using a tap guide. These are really useful things to have in the workshop and very simple to make. In my series, Model Engineering for Beginners, I show how I made one of these. It's not difficult to get the tap straight in the hole if you had plenty of experience, but if you haven't, this little gadget does it for you. I originally made this tap guide for quarter by 40 taps, and as this tap is 6 millimeters in diameter and not a quarter of an inch, it's not a tight fit in the hole, but it's still better than doing it freehand. This is a taper or first tap. As you can see from this clip, it's wandering about all over the place until the main body of the tap engages with the tap guide, then it stops wobbling about and cuts straight. I don't really use much metric equipment in the workshop, but if I use metric taps and dies frequently, I would make a set of tap guides in metric sizes. But this one works fine in this application. Don't forget, once again, this is not a precision item. This is a big lump of cast iron that holds the base of a boiler in place. It is not a part for a jet engine, or for a satellite, so it's not rocket science in this case. But that is no excuse for sloppy workmanship. If you think before you drill the holes, 
then you will not have to file out the holes to the correct position and you won't make too many mistakes. I'm quite pleased with this. The Allen bolts are going into the holes and through into the cast iron without any binding whatsoever and the ash pan fits pretty well in the correct position on the cast iron base. The other reason for using M6 bolts is explained here. I could, if I needed to, lift the entire boiler off the bench by putting M6 bolts in the bottom as shown here. If I wanted to elevate the base further, I would have to fit the sixth bolt in place to prevent the boiler from tipping, but I don't need to fit the extra bolt. I'm going to use the five M6 bolts to hold this part onto the wooden baseboard. It was a strange coincidence, but after I started making the ash pan base, Michael Whitehouse, the designer of Castle Steam Boilers, sent me a computer-generated image of the proposed ash pan mounting that they're going to make, and guess what? It was very similar to mine. I'm a really big fan of Castle Steam Boilers. I just love the way that they're made. It's time to paint the base. I'm using a plastic bowl turned upside down on a piece of wood sat on my belt sander because this is where I do most of my painting, professional to the end. Or is it just because my workshop's very small? Anyway, on with the job. Whenever I paint metal parts, I always use this primer. This is manufactured by Phoenix Precision Paints, and it's PQ1 Grey Single Pack Etch Primer. This etch primer is so good it even sticks to brass. The directions for use of this paint are very specific. It says, make sure that you do not put it on too thick. You need to apply the paint in a very thin coat so you can still see the metal underneath the paint. The directions also state that you must leave at least 24 hours before overcoating. I thought it would be a good idea to make a video to show which etch primers work the best. I'll be doing that very shortly. I'm currently collecting different etch primers to use in the experiment. I'm going to leave you with this clip of the etch primer drying. And as the men in white coats have just arrived to take me back to the asylum, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.